Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive with Dr. Rebecca Risk. Do you ever feel that even though nothing seems seriously wrong and you pass all the medical tests, that you still feel that your health, pain, and fatigue are completely out of control? It doesn't have to be that way. Listen to the tips and suggestions given on our program today and take back control of your health. Now, here is Dr. Rebecca Risk. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're speaking with David Montgomery. He is um, a a professor of geomorphology at the University of Washington. He studies landscape evolution and the effects of geological processes on ecological systems and human societies. And today we're discussing his book, Growing a Revolution, Bringing Our Soil Back to Life. David, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Rebecca. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So what inspired you to write this book? Well, you know, uh, I'm a geologist, and so I wasn't trained to look at soil directly, but I'm the kind of geologist that studies the evolution of topography, the shape of the land. And there's sort of a long journey that took me to being uh, concerned about farming, the way we grow our food, what it does for our health. But it started with looking at soil erosion as a problem around the world. Because 10 years ago, I wrote a book called Dirt, the Erosion of Civilizations that looked at the relationship between how societies treated their land and then how the land then was able to support those societies or not over the long run. Sort of looking at the, the relation between the health of the land and the health of civilizations, of people at a large scale. And what I realized is that the state of the world's soils today is one of the most underappreciated yet very important environmental crises that we face because our agricultural soils are degraded. Um, they're not as fertile and pr- as they once were. Um, And I got looking at that through the the back channel of history, Uh, and I know that you're interviewing my wife, Anne Buckley, about a book, The Hidden Half of Nature, that we wrote that looked at how she restored life to the soil in our yard as I was writing this book about the destruction of soil through history. And that, you know, all kinds of light bulbs went off, and we wrote that book together. And then I got inspired to write Growing a Revolution by thinking about could the practices that Anne was using to restore fertility and life to our yard, could they work on farms around the world? Could they work at scale? Um, how might we restore the, the fertility of the world's soils as a consequence of agriculture rather than degrading them as we do through conventional agriculture? And that was the, the inspiration for this book that took me on a journey from being a bit of a pessimist about our um, ability to grow food into the future to someone who thinks that, well, the soil degradation problem can be solved, but it requires changing the way we think about the land, thinking about soil, thinking about our own health. And so that's the sort of the background on the book. It's a surprisingly optimistic book about how we can move agriculture to a more sustainable and health-promoting platform. Well, you know, it, a lot of the what you talk about in your book, I, I thought that would be new, would be old news to me. And um, of course, I'm not a farmer, so I, I don't know why I thought that. But um, you know, I found it really fascinating um, that it was things I hadn't thought about before. I mean, we know that that pesticides are causing damage, and and we know, and I talk every day about what that's doing to our health and when we're consuming yeah. it. But the way that you explained how soil works really related it and and this is what what I loved about your book because as a doctor of Chinese medicine I always tell people well we look at the earth the same way as a human body it can be human body can be too dry too damp to all of this stuff and when you described what goes on in the earth it was the same as our human microbiome to me and there was a direct connection there with the damage that we're doing to both Yes, you know, that, that that is so parallel to where Anne and my thinking have gone on this, because we sort of came from the other end of it, coming from the soil end, but uh, we also recognized the connections between the way the microbiome in the root zone of plants, the rhizosphere, as it's called, uh, how that affects the acquisition of nutrients, uh, chemical signaling with the plants, promoting the, the, the immune system of the plants, plant's defense system. All those functions are, are parallel with what we now know goes on in the human gut. And this whole idea that microbial life, our microbiomes and our crops microbiomes and, and our dogs microbiomes are the, the, the connections between microbial communities and the health of the host organisms, the sort of nature we can see with our own senses, 
that whole understanding has just been revolutionized in the last couple decades. And um, we're in growing revolution. I was looking at what that means for agriculture. Um, but there's there's great parallels uh, with human health and, and strong connections between how we treat the land and how that then facilitates the growing of, of healthy, nutrient-rich crops that can help uh, support our health. Um, so there's a, a sort of a long road that's taken this geologist into thinking about uh, the nature of soil fertility and how to restore it on farms. But it's really an underappreciated and hugely important issue. Um, and thank you well, for the kind words about the book. I, we love it when people like the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, got, I got pretty excited. Um, I, I, can you just tell us a little bit about um, it, what, one thing I enjoyed was when, when you talked about all the bacteria in the soil and how important it is. Can you just tell um, my listeners what that is? Yeah, so you can think of, uh, if you think about the importance of all the life in the soil, the bacteria and the fungi and the, the protists and the archaeans and all the, um, the various life forms, both microscopic and then the ones we can actually see when we dig into the soil, the worms and the, and the arachnids and the, so forth. When we think about their importance, uh, there, there's different levels to think about it on, but if we think about it at the, the most basic level, the root level of how is life making a living on this planet? Where, where do the elements that get pulled together to make a plant or eventually to nourish a person come from? You know, we know that, that the carbon and oxygen are coming from CO2 that plants take in through photosynthesis. Uh, combined with water to make carbohydrates, uh, the, the sugary, uh, the sugar and cellulose backbones of their bodies, and they get nitrogen from those nitrogen-fixing bacteria that partner with plants and their roots. But that's only four elements. So then the hydrogen comes from the water. So that's only four elements, and we're made up of so many more things. All these micronutrients, as they're called, mineral elements, elements that came originally from rocks. And so how do those elements get out of the rocks and into plants and then into people? It turns out that a lot of that's facilitated by those microbes in the soil, the bacteria and the fungi that um, help break down rocks and extract those mineral elements that are so essential for our nutrition. And one of the fascinating things that Ann and I learned in um, working on these topics was that plants will put out into the soil um, sugars, proteins, even fats, um, they exude them out of their roots, so they're called exudates. And they do this to feed the, the life in the soil because that soil life is getting those nutrients out of the mineral particles and trading them to the plants uh, in really underground symbioses that are kind of similar to what goes on in the world above ground we know between, say, pollinators and flowers these partnerships between different species where they're each looking after their own interests, but they both benefit. Those same kind of relationships are happening in the soil, and it turns out to be fundamental to, to plant health because a lot of their, their defense systems and their nutrient acquisition systems are, have developed, have evolved in partnership with soil life. So it turns out that the way we treat soil life in our farming practices is actually really central to the problem of building and maintaining soil fertility but what we've been doing to the soil with our conventional farming practices has adversely affected soil life at a global scale. There's just a paper that came out this last spring that was looking at what's happened to worms uh, in, farm, in farmland globally. And the conclusion they came to is we've lost something like 80% of the worms off the world's farmlands. Um, this is not good. <laughs> no. No, it, you know, I actually, I, I was talking to my mom yesterday because in her retirement, she bought a bunch of land and has this huge garden and, and she um, is very strict with how she she deals with it. She does a lot about what you talked in your book, but she doesn't live near me. So I had to ask her, what do you do? So she, <laughs> she, she does a lot of what you, you talk about basically um, piling on, you know, things, compost and, and things like that. She doesn't disturb the, the, um, the ground and she told me when she finds worms she'll actually if there's a lot of them she'll actually move them around and it reminded me of the um, seven years in Tibet movie where they're saving worms when they're <laughs> knocking a building down and uh, w which I think is is really fundamental to to what you're talking about as well though is we're not respecting the land and what's in it and we're destroying a system that was already set up to work properly. 
Yes, that that, that scene of the the young Dalai Lama um, saving the worms from the the, yeah. the excavation was it's it's a powerful metaphor for respecting life on this planet. And one of the other people who um, had a really powerful respect for worms, it turns out, is Charles Darwin, because the he wrote that he called worms uh, God's plowmen. Um, because he recognized, he literally spent his whole life studying worms, sort of in and around studying the other things he was working on. Um, but the very last book that he wrote was um, called On the Formation of the Vegetable Mold, basically on the formation of soil. And he basically attributed the fertility of England's farm fields to the action of countless generations of worms that were tilling the soil, mixing organic matter, um, decaying once living plant matter into the mineral part of the soil to make that the rich combination of biology and geology that we know of as fertile soil. If you just have a pile of rocks, it's not very fertile. If you just have a bunch of um, uh, 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 plant matter, you know, you need the mineral matter as well. So it's that combination that makes really fertile soil. And worms are engineered, it would seem, to do that. Um, so the, 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 dist- the loss of worms from the world's farm fields is something that um, is basically taking out a very natural, time-tested for millions of years process through which soils are maintained in a fertile state. It's taking that key actor out of the out of the puzzle, and that's sort of a, a metaphor for what modern agriculture has done to the life within our soils through intensive tillage, over application of chemical fertilizers and pesticides. Um, it's really a, a major fundamental transition in one of Earth's life support systems that we're not paying enough attention to, and that's why I wrote the book: is that there there are farming practices that can cultivate the beneficial life in the soil, and it's adopting those practices that really offers us a, a bridge to take modern agriculture and all its phenomenal productivity and transition it into a more productive yet sustainable agriculture. And that, that's the sort of the angle that I look for in the book. Well, you talk a lot about no-till methods, and and from what I had understood about farming and gardening, that's what you do. So, what, what, why wouldn't you do that? Oh, why wouldn't you do no-till? Why, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you till? Oh, why wouldn't you yeah. dig in the soil? Yes, no, yeah. Are, our brains are kind of hardwired to dig in the soil. Like most gardeners, you know, you love to get your hands in the dirt. To, um, and for a while, I accused her of having migratory plants because she was moving them around the yard to figure out where they would do best. Um, yes, there's this great impulse to dig. And, you know, the history of the plow goes back, you know, some 6,000 years or so, not quite to the dawn of agriculture, but a long way back. And it's sort of the iconic emblem of agriculture. It's on the seal of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Thomas Jefferson's plow is sort of front and center. So what? how could it be not a good thing to plow. Well, it turns out that when you think about it in terms of what it does to soil life, that's the connection. Because going back to all those worms in the soil, which are just some of the, you know, they're the giants of the soil world, um, but we can see them so we can kind of relate to them a little bit better than bacteria and fungi. Um, So what happens when we uh, drag a plow across an agricultural field? It's kind of like if somebody took the roof off your house once a year, took a giant spoon and stirred up all your belongings, it would be a you know, completely disruptive to your life. That's what plowing does to worms. It, it literally destroys their homes, their burrows. It mixes things up. It can chop them in half. That kind of direct disturbance is something that's not conducive to growing the beneficial life that, that does partner with plants. Um, mycorrhizal fungi, for example, the fungi in the soil that whose little root-like hyphae connect up to the roots of plants and act essentially as root extensions that allow them to get mineral particles from the soil into their bodies in exchange for the sugars the plant can make through photosynthesis, a plow breaks those networks up. It'd be kind of like if somebody you know, took all the bridges out on the interstate highway system. It would disrupt the movement of goods and services in the economy. Same thing happens below ground when we plow and break up the network of fungal hyphae. So when you think about what um, plowing does to the soil, that's one big effect. The other effect is what I mostly wrote about in that first book that got me into all this, Dirt, the Erosion of Civilizations, and that is if you, leave, if you plow, you leave the surface of the earth bare and 
not covered by plants for some part of the year until the next crop or the weeds come back in. And that means the land is vulnerable to erosion from either rain or wind. And if that goes on for long enough, uh, it can quite literally um, erode the soil out from under a civilization. It happened to the ancient Greeks. It happened to the Romans. It happened in the southeast United States. That history is what I write about in Dirt. But it happens slow enough we don't notice it year to year. So it's, so counterintuitively, plowing is one of the more destructive acts of, of agriculture, but its effects don't manifest unless you run in time frames that a geologist would consider relevant. You know, you're dealing with, with you know, decades to centuries to millennia to, to really destroy the soil that way. Well, that's, I, I found that that really interesting to read about because, uh, you know, not being a farmer, I had no idea that that we weren't supposed to do that. And I think a lot of people don't know, which I guess is why you're uh, growing a revolution as the title of your book. Um, we yeah, are going to so take a lot of yeah. a lot of the world's farmers are still are still tilling and plowing, and so yeah. one of the. The key found, sort of the foundation for a sustainable agriculture is don't disturb the ground. But it's really just the first step, because as we yeah. will probably go into, there's there's other practices that, in combination with with not tilling, allow us to rebuild soil fertility even as we farm quite intensively. Yeah, definitely. Well, we're going to talk about that more when we come back. We're going to take a quick break. We're talking today with David Montgomery, and we're discussing his book, Growing a Revolution. We'll be back shortly. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health and Wellness. The largest syndicated alternative health talk program has come to the Voice America Network. The Dr. Bob Martin Show is the program that will answer your health questions and help you to heal your own body of many different ailments. Each week, you'll hear the answers that Dr. Bob gives to his callers that help them to be their own doctor most of the time. We'll also discuss developments on the health care front and what you need to do to keep your body in top form. The Dr. Bob Martin Show airs Wednesday mornings at 9 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Pacific on Voice America Health and Wellness. The Voice America Live Events Channel is here now to showcase your corporate, individual, or organization's live event. Visit voiceamerica.com forward slash live events to see all of our past live events and find out more. Whether it's a multi-day conference, special speaker, or single day event, we've got everything to make your event a success. We can do a few hours or a few days. For more information about taking your event to the next level, call Jeff Spinard at 480-294-6417 or email info at voiceamerica.com. Again, that's Jeff Spinard at 480-294-6417 or send us an email to info at voiceamerica.com. Voice America is where you are and where you want to be. Join us around the globe as we broadcast live from some of the most interesting events available. Don't forget to view all our live events, including on-demand access to past events that you may have missed by visiting voiceamerica.com forward slash live events. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're talking with David Montgomery about his book, Growing a Revolution. So, David, when we're talking about soil health, soil health, what happens when we're spraying pesticides and herbicides on it, if we have this nice ecosystem with worms and fungi and bacteria? Yeah, well, you know, that thinking about the soil as an ecosystem is exactly the right way to frame it, because you can think about you can think about health in a whole lot of contexts. There's sort of, you know, our individual health, there's the public health of a whole society, 
And in the ecological world, you can think of the health of your pets. You could think of the health of an ecosystem fairly broadly. And if we think about soil health in that last context, about sort of the, the health of the ecosystem of the soil, then what you're really thinking about is the relationships between all the organisms in the soil and then the plants that it supports and so forth. And so what is it about the sort of modern agricultural practices of um, the overuse of chemical fertilizers and pesticides, how does that affect soil life? And there's no sort of simple answer in the sense that, well, it depends who's there and depends what you're putting on it and other practices as well. But the, 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 the sort of the general picture is that it can disrupt those communities of organisms that are in the soil. Um, for example, uh, tillage and the overuse of nitrogen fertilizer can really accelerate the breakdown of the organic matter that's in the soil, the, the, um, which equates to soil carbon. These are dead things that are being recycled by nature's recycling system from once living back into the elements that can plants can take back up to fertilize themselves uh, for and build the next generation of plants. And those communities of organisms in the soil can be disrupted by those changes. Um, and if you draw down... Uh, if the the soil organic matter level gets depleted because you're oxidizing it from tillage, exposing it to the to the air, accelerating the microbial breakdown of soil carbon, you're drawing down the batteries of the soil faster than you otherwise would because it's that organic matter that's feeding the microbes in the soil. So you can kind of think of it as it's a, a quick shot of of nutrition to plants by doing that, but then they lose their long-term sustained nutrition. Um, and if you look at what's happened to soil organic matter on the world's farming, farmland soils, um, and if you focus on North America first, the most recent paper I've seen on it suggests that we've lost about half of the organic matter in our agricultural soils over the last couple hundred years, and the, sort of the, since the arrival of European agricultural methods. And that's effectively means that we've drained about half of the native fertility out of our uh, farmlands, which is one of the reasons why we're so uh, dependent at present on chemical fertilizers to maintain high crop yields. Because if you've got a really rich, healthy, fertile soil with a lot of organic matter in it, and you add nitrogen fertilizer to it, you don't get a boost in yield. You're just kind of wasting your money on nitrogen fertilizer. Mm -hmm. But if you've got a land that has been degraded, where you've lost a lot of the organic matter and lost a lot of the fuel for the microbes that are actually getting nutrition into the plants, if you add chemical fertilizers to it, you can boost your yields. You can still grow plants, but you fundamentally change the relationship between the plants and their roots and the life in the soil. Um, when it means you've basically become dependent on those chemical fertilizers because the plants will, uh, when they're not getting um, feedback from the life in the soil, they won't put out as many of those exudates to feed that soil life, which means it's a vicious circle. You essentially um, shut down some of the nutrient acquisition and, and um, chemical signaling um, and the microbial metabolite production that's actually beneficial for plants. So really thinking about it as an ecological system, our modern farming practices go in and change that. And they can turn fungally dominated soil communities into bacterially dominated communities. The net amount of life in the soil may not change, but who's there may completely change, which then changes functions. So thinking about it as an ecological system is a very powerful way to look at it. And this sort of really almost kind of revolutionary idea um, that Ann and I ran into in looking to this is thinking about the health of the soil. Uh, we don't tend to think of soil as something that has health. We tend, you know, we call it dirt. We don't, we don't tend to respect soil in, in normal conversations. Yet we do need to think about it in an ecological context because that will reframe how we think about farming. Well, I I love how you you talk about it in your book because you you talk about the differences between soil that's alive and soil that's dead, and and I I've never thought about it that way. I mean I mean I I, I don't know how it would have come 
to me because I don't have, I, I live in a condo, I don't have a garden, I live in the city. Um, but it, it, the way you describe all the places that you went to where they're doing these no-till systems and, and then they don't have to spray, um, you, you know, and, and the different color of the earth, it turns this like chocolatey brown color and, um, you know, it's moister and, and it just sounded, well, it, it, it made sense to me as you explained it that that is something that, that we would want. Yeah, you know, the wonderful thing about a lot of this stuff is that it, it does make sense if you think about it through the right lens and perspective. And that, that color change you're describing, which, you know, we saw, I first ran into that in my own yard, because that's what Anne did to our soil, as I'm sure she'll talk to you about, is that she took our land from being sort of this khaki beach sand color to rich, dark, black earth in, you know, a little over a decade. And as a geologist, I would have thought that it would take much longer to actually do that. It takes nature, you know, centuries to do that. And here she had done it in years, uh, right in our own yard. And to see that same transition happen on farms around the world, in in, uh, equatorial Africa and Costa Rica and across North America, um, you know, that was really eye-opening to me as to how fast we could actually pull off that color change. And it's mostly about putting carbon into the ground because that going from that khaki beach sand to deep rich black earth the correlation to the amount of carbon of the soil organic matter once living things uh is very very strong and so how do you do that how do you get carbon back into the ground how do you get organic matter into the ground and you know i go into that in various chapters in the book the various ways to do it but a very effective way is sort of the second piece of the puzzle after that if you do in addition to the no-till farming that we were talking about where you don't plow and you plant using other methods to get seeds into the soil for which there's there's machinery that to do that on large industrialized farms um or you can do it with a digging stick if you're doing a little plot in your garden um but the second piece is growing cover crops keeping living roots active in the soil at all times pushing those exudates out to feed the soil microbes but also to have plant to have um, cover so that the soil is not bare and eroding. And it, those two things, cover crops and no-till, they stop the disturbance and they start adding carbon back into the soil, which helps to recharge the, the, the soil's batteries, build up uh, soil organic matter. And if you combine those two things with the third leg of the conservation agriculture stool, uh, which is a diversity of rotations so that you're not just growing one or two crops. You've got, you know, five or six crops in either in the fields or in a rotation or in those cover crops. Um, you put those three pieces together and it turns out that's a recipe for building up the beneficial life in the soil, um, with building up that organic matter, which is the way you turn that khaki beach sand into the rich, dark, chocolatey earth. And once you do that, once you get back to that really rich, fertile soil, one doesn't need very much in the way of fertilizer or pesticides or even herbicides if you manage the weeds right. Uh, In other words, one can wean oneself as a farmer, even on some really large farms. They could wean themselves off of the expensive agrochemical inputs that are, you know, dominate the economics of farms today. And when I realized that that was sort of a, a, a viable way forward based on visiting farmers around the world who'd already done it and proven that it could work, um, I was really um, heartened because if there's one thing that we need ag- that agriculture must do in order to be sustainable, it has to work for the farmers economically. Otherwise, they won't keep doing it, and we all need to eat. So we need it to be economical for farmers to farm. The idea that we that they could make more money as farmers by growing just as much food but spending less on all the expensive inputs that they're um that they that conventional farmers are dependent on today um that to me was an optimistic eye opener because that could align the short term interests and long term interests of farmers with the larger scale interests of society at large in preserving our environment preserving the fertility of the land and growing healthier food to feed our to feed us all individually um so that that venture of going to visit farmers that had already done this was was incredibly eye-opening to me 
Yeah, I, I, I loved your stories about wh- where you went and, and I think you went to Africa and they were showing people how to to do this kind of farming and it was saving time and money and then they were making more so the, their yeah. crops were surviving better without the pesticides and the till and they didn't have to till so they had more time to do other things. Yes, it was, and the key was really sort of thinking about the soil differently because when they when they flip their perspective to instead of thinking what do they need to add to the soil to try and grow food to instead what are the practices that cultivate the life in the soil um, they completely flipped their their uh, their operations in ways that um, did not require much in the way of agrochemicals and yet doubled their crop yields which was you know it's, it's almost miraculous, but the they had the place that I visited in Ghana um, had originally had a four or five percent organic matter forest soil in in the original jungle. Um, their agricultural soils in the region that I visited were now down to less than one percent. They'd really sort of burned through the batteries of the soil, and they were struggling. Um, they'd managed to rebuild their organic matter back up to you know three or four percent, not quite back up to the native soil, um, but getting close by adopting this new suite of practices, this new philosophy of farming of don't disturb the soil, plant cover crops, and grow a diversity of crops. Um, Which if you think about it, that philosophy is exactly opposite of what the main points behind what's now conventional uh, agriculture worldwide, where people are encouraged to intensively till, to plow a lot, to use a lot of agrochemicals, and to plant just one or two crops to specialize. Those three points are 180 degrees from this new style of conservation agriculture, of ditching the plow, covering up with cover crops, and growing a diversity of plants. And that's not to say that, um, and that doesn't mention things like organic versus conventional or GMO crops versus other crops. These ideas cut across, I think, those debates because all kinds of farms, whether large or small, capitalized or, or subsistence, um, organic or conventional, they can all benefit from the application of those principles to cultivate the beneficial life in the soil. And so that's one of the key points I tried to make in the book, is that we need to adopt this new philosophy of agriculture as the foundation for both our conventional and our organic agriculture. Um, and, and things like permaculture, they're already like, you know, most, most of the way there, if not already there, <laughs> on applying these principles. Um, but the the trick to me that was the take home from visiting these people all over the world was that those principles applied universally, but the practices you would use to implement them were really dependent on the climate you were in, the soils that you actually had on your farm, the kind of crops that you were growing. In other words, there's no sort of simple answer, but there's some simple principles that are very different that we had. So changing the way we think about the soil as the foundation for farming um, I'm arguing really could be the foundation for the next agricultural revolution that could combine the miracles of modern technology with the wisdom of ancient practices because those cover crops and a diversity of you know and a crop rotation those are not new ideas those are ideas that have been traditional in a lot of societies because they worked combining them with no till that's the new thing okay so can you um, tell us a little bit more about what cover crops are Sure. What a cover crop is, is it's a crop that you plant uh, without necessarily intending to sell as a farmer. You know, you think about what farmers do as an economic activity, and they, they plant, they nurture plants, and then they sell their crops. Cover crops are crops that are grown to, in effect, feed the soil rather than to be shipped off to, uh, for sale. Um, and so say you have a, uh, a place where you can get... Um, a few weeks to a few months of growth in between two normally commercial crops. Uh, rather than plowing up the, the remains of the last harvest in preparation for planting the next one, if instead you plant a cover crop that can come in like, like a clover or a vetch or some kind of a, a crop that you can then kill before the next crop comes in, and you just let it rot. So you think, think of it as those cover crops as a way to suck some carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and build organic matter, <clears throat> build the plant bodies, but also suck some mineral elements out of the soil and subsoil 
and get them incorporated into organic matter. And then when it rots, all those elements then become available to the soil microbes, which recycle them into materials that the next generation, the crops, the cash crops, can take up. So cover crops serve by keeping the land covered in between the commercial crops, do a few services for the farmer. They protect the soil from erosion. They can actually help um, build soil health and build soil organic matter, which will help retain water in the soil and help feed those microbes. Um, but those cover crops also get recycled by the microbes and themselves turn into uh, effectively green manure, green fertilizer, that the next generation of cash crops can draw from for their sustenance. So a cover crop is sort of a, a, a different style of planting uh, involved in an agricultural rotation. It, well, it, you talk about it a lot in your book, and it it, uh, had, it was something I'd never heard of, but it, it makes sense. I mean, when we're talking about even just soil erosion, to protect the soil from from eroding, and, and which is a big thing with the tilling as well, that, that you're losing your topsoil. Yeah, and the best thing you can do to keep soil in place is to have a plant cover it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, when you look at uh, the way that... Um, if you go out into nature and you, you walk around in a native grassland or a native forest, there's very few places where there's bare earth. You know, you'll see it in a few places, like if a bear dug something up or something, but you don't see a whole lot of bare earth uh, once you're, if you're below timberline and not in a really hyper-arid desert. Nature, nature clothes herself in plants, in part because if you don't have plants covering the soil, the rain can carry it away faster than it can form. It's the, it's, there's, there's been this long-running coevolution of plants and soil and soil organic matter that really helped biology conquer the continents. Um, the, the early, you know, you look at the early relationships between plants and the soil, and uh, you know, some 450 million odd years ago, there were already relationships between the fungus and the soil. The, uh, the fungi in the soil were helping to feed the plants um, by partnering with plant roots. The plants would grow up. They would then die. The organic matter would go back into the soil, would help feed the fungus. The fungus would then help the plants. Um, and there's this sort of positive feedback that helped the development of, of soils around the world that have been so effective at supporting um, vegetation communities now for hundreds of millions of years. Oh, that, that's beautiful. Um, we're going to take a quick break. We're talking today with David Montgomery. We're discussing his book, Growing a Revolution. We'll be back shortly. Opinions, options, answers. You're listening to Voice America Health and Wellness. Take us on the go. It's even easier now. The Voice America Talk Radio Network has a mobile app for iOS, Android, or Amazon Kindle. Visit the Apple App Store, Amazon, or Google Play to download the app powered by Aircast. It's free and no registration is necessary. In minutes, you could be enjoying your favorite Voice America Talk Radio host no matter where you are, in the car, out and about, while traveling, or anytime you can't be close to your computer. Catch up on the archives you've missed or discover new shows on the spot. Search Voice America at your favorite app store. What causes us to be sick? We're not talking about the actual illness or the scientific cause of illnesses. We're talking about your body and health. Listen for the healing whisper of return to peace. Each week, host Dr. Marianne Chase shows you how to listen to your heart to identify poor health, stress, and disease. You'll learn how to heal energetically and spiritually as well as physically. It's time to depend less on the drugs and more on the heart. The Healing Whisper airs live every Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 8 a.m. Pacific on Voice America Health & Wellness. Follow the Voice America Talk Radio Network on Twitter. We're at Voice America TRN. You'll get the latest fix on what's happening with our shows, this week's featured guests, and general happenings that you should know about at the Voice America Talk Radio Network. Now you don't have to miss anything when you're away from your home or office. Just go to twitter.com forward slash Voice America TRN or follow along with us at Voice America TRN, the Voice America Talk Radio Network. We're on the cutting edge of social media. Can you keep up? Opinions, options, answers. You're listening to Voice America Health and Wellness. You 
are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Riss. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Riss. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're talking with David Montgomery, and we're discussing his book, Growing a Revolution, Bringing Our Soil Back to Life. So, David, we mentioned in the first segment a little bit about the soil's immune system, and I I just keep thinking of um, a show I did on the dangers of Roundup, and um, we're talking about super weeds that people aren't able to fight off anymore. (coughs) Excuse me. And it, it, it brings a, a parallel with the super bugs that humans are dealing with um, because of all the antibiotics and, and things that we're using, um, that this is the same issue that, that the soil and our earth are dealing with and that people are dealing with. Yeah, there, there are real parallels there. Um, and we, um, one of the things that you often hear with, uh, with no-till farming is that one of the things that really helped the adoption of it was ironically the development of glyphosate resistant crops because that meant that weed control which can be an issue one of the reasons people plowed for centuries is it's excellent weed control to you know reset everything um but the development of gmo crops actually helped the adoption of no-till because it made weed control really easy so one of the things i really want to look at in my book was, well, do you need the glyphosate? Do you have, can you do no-till without the herbicide? And I ran into farmers who had figured out how to do that and figured out how to do it very well. And so, that, you know, if you hear that you must do glyphosate to do no-till, that's simply not correct. There's other ways to manage the weed problem. Um, so that then brings up, well, what does glyphosate then do in the soil? And there's, there's two things that glyphosate is actually patented for that it's very good at. Um, one is chelating mineral elements. And what that means is binding them up. Well, chelation is a process by which an organic molecule wraps around a mineral element and essentially ties it up into its own structure, and thereby making that mineral element unavailable to other things like plants that might want to extract it from the soil. So there's, there's serious concern that one of the things that um, you know, the overuse of glyphosate has done in soils in relation to soil health is that it has bound up a lot of mineral elements that are then no longer able to get into plants. Uh, just how serious a problem that is is something that's still uh, being looked at, but it's a, very, it's a logical connection to make given one of the patents on glyphosate. The other patent, another patent on glyphosate uh, is that it's a really good antibiotic. And so what does it do to soil life, to the biology of the soil, that plants are putting out all those exudates to try and feed? What are we doing when we then add antibiotics to the soil in ways that are a broad spectrum antibiotics? So you're killing off the good microbes along with the bad microbes. And of course, I don't mean good and bad in terms of their intent, but in terms of their effect. Some of them do things that we'd like to have happen. Some of them do things we don't want to have happen. But when you kill them all off with the broad spectrum biocide, uh, you're, you're over impacting the beneficial ones because they tend to be more numerous than the pathogens, which come back the fastest. And there's real, there's real parallels with the overuse of antibiotics in the human body in that way. And one of the big questions um, that I think we'll see more research into in the next few years is to what degree does the um, presence of glyphosate in our food system, to what degree does that impact the human microbiome or the gut microbiome? There's been very little research I've been able to find on that but so far, but there have been studies in Europe that have looked at the effects on livestock gut microbiota and have seen really large effects at very small concentrations. So my suspicion is that we'll see more, more and more concern about those connections, uh, both in terms of what it does to the health of the soil, but also in terms of what it does to our own health when it gets into interacting with our own internal microbiome. Well, you know, I'm also wondering, as you're explaining what, what this is doing, what is happening if, if our soil isn't as healthy as it should be, does that mean that our food isn't getting the nutrients that it used to have? 
That you've just hit on is exactly the new book that Ann and I are working on, uh, literally uh, in and around as we speak. <laughs> Because um, that's that's a question that we we are very interested in and curious about because uh, we've done enough research in writing the books that we have already to look at the effects of um, soil life on just on how nutrients get from the soil into plants and then what farming practices do to those processes and how we can turn them around to rebuild soil health and fertility. So now we're trying to focus on that very connection of how much does it matter to the nutritional value of food and what does that then do to the health of our livestock and uh, human health. And a a few of the things we've run into already are that, uh, oddly enough, it seems like there's a far greater literature on the effects of the quality of forage on livestock than there is on the effects of food quality on people. There's a lot of work that's gone into um, looking at um, these are the effects of uh, or the diff- nutritional differences between, say, organic and conventionally grown foods. But one of the take home messages that I found in Growing a Revolution is that just because farming practices are organic doesn't mean that they're building healthy, fertile soil. And some of the farmers that I ran into who had been conventional farmers but weaned themselves off of agrochemicals by adopting these regenerative conservation agriculture methods we talked about earlier, um, they had developed really healthy, fertile soil and rarely used any chemicals. Would I started teasing them that they were organic-ish farmers, which they thought was kind of quite funny. But uh, I was thinking that, wow, these guys are probably growing really healthy, nutrient-rich food in ways that may be better than some of the large-scale you know, plow-based intensive disturbance organic farms um, that have really degraded their soil. And we know that organic farming can degrade soil because that's what happened to the Romans and the classical Greeks. They were not using agrochemicals. They were organic farmers, and they still managed to destroy their soils. Um, So one of the things Ann and I are going to try and look at in this new book is to try and sort of cut through the sort of organic versus conventional um, uh, arguments and debates and try and focus on, okay, well, what's the role of healthy, fertile soil in building nutrient-rich crops that can help... uh, nourish both our livestock and and ourselves because there's there's sound studies that have looked at the decline of mineral micronutrients in food over the last 50 60 years and the decreases are shocking you know 25 percent to more than 50 percent depending on which mineral in what food um we're going to try and have a much closer look at all those kind of things in this new book. And if anyone has a great idea for a title, we're in the market for a good title. Feel free to send it to us. <laughs> That's awesome. So <laughs> what what I'm wondering is if this is so beneficial, <clears throat> excuse me, if it's cheaper and, and you get more yield out of your crop and um, it's better for the environment and our food, why isn't this being done more? That's a really great question I wrestled with in the new book. Um, there were a number of farmers I visited who had done all the things that you said, that, that they were growing more food at lower cost, so they were more profitable, and yet their neighbors still thought they were crazy because they were doing it with this sort of unconventional new style of farming. Um, I think that it can take some time for new ideas to sort of diffuse out because one of the biggest barriers to change is just habits, what we're used to doing. Um, and what we're really talking about here with sort of growing this, growing this the conservation agriculture revolution is, is changing the way that people think about the soil. And oddly enough, sometimes changing your mind about something, uh, as simple as it can be in principle, it costs you nothing, <laughs> um, but it can be one of the most difficult things to do. Um, so we have you know, generations of crop advisors uh, who've been trained to think in a particular system of farming. And this is changing the ground rules, if you will, of how you would think about applying um, uh, technology on a farm. Um, so there's, there's essentially the information uh, a diffusion problem. There's also the problem that there hasn't been a whole lot of research focused at this whole system of, of three pieces, no-till, cover crops, and the diversity of rotation. Most academic studies have focused on one piece of those three, 
And my take home from visiting farmers who'd adopted it is that it's the full system of all three practices that really kickstarts soil life. So if you're just sort of studying one leg of a stool, you don't you're you're looking at a pogo stick, not a stool, and it's it's a whole, it's not really the right kind of uh, framing for looking at it. So there's there's research that needs to be done, um, and there's also you know quite obviously if you have a a uh, new system of farming that does not rely as much on all the inputs that um, the industry sells to farmers uh, under the, the argument that they need these things to actually grow profitable crops. Um, there's not a major incentive for those companies to advertise a new way of doing business to the farmers if it will reduce the amount of their product that's being sold. So it's a problem with you have this new set of practices that farmers can adopt without actually buying anything. Well, um, and and spending less money on pesticides and diesel, as you talk about in your book. So there is no money yeah. to be made from anyone aside from them, them if they adopt this. Yeah, with, with one exception, and that is they're, they're, to go no-till, you do need new um, a new planter. You need new hardware. Um, and so what I've seen is that um, in talking with farmers in the American Midwest is it seems like as people sort of turn over, you know, in, their, in the market for a new planter, um, plows are not selling very well and no-till planters are selling much better. So mm-hmm. there, there is a big shift going on, but it's still in the sort of starting days of it. Um, but yeah, that, that difference between practices and products, um, you can teach people practices and they can then go adopt them on their own. There's a, there's a much stronger incentive for people to advertise products that they could, are trying to sell to farmers. And mm-hmm. if you look at where farmers get their advice today, an awful lot of the sources of information and advice come either from the companies that are trying to sell them products or from um, sort of academic research partnerships between universities and companies that are trying to develop new products. Okay. So when somebody adopts these practices, do they start seeing changes right away or does it take some time? Uh, that's, that's a great question. And, and uh, the real answer is I got varying responses from the farmers I interviewed. My takeaway is that it seems to take a couple years uh, to really start noticing the soil getting improving and responding and you know anywhere from three to four years to actually get profitability back to the point where it was beforehand but all the farmers that I talked to had adopted these these um, methods uh, commented that they would see you know reduced input costs you know they would save money on what they were spending uh, straight out of the gate um, and some of them noticed big changes in their soil within a couple years uh, the farmers who've been doing it the longest, 20, 30 years, um, obviously saw the biggest changes in their soil, and those are the guys that had virtually weaned themselves off of agrochemicals. So there's a transition, and one of the things that I think needs to be recognized and thought about at the policy level is what is it that we could do to our agricultural policies and subsidies uh, to incentivize farmers to adopt this new regenerative style of farming and get them through that transition period so that uh, once they had restarted to rebuild the fertility of their land and and they were able to crank down on their chemical use, that they would then be um, sort of on the path, if you will, of of doing this new, more regenerative farming. Some assistance with the transition period would, would I think, help with two things. One, it would help more farmers make it through that period, um, but also it would remove some of the, the risk barriers that you're asking about why aren't more people doing this style of farming. And yeah. one of the questions would be, you know, do you really want to run the risk of your farm this year doing something new or just do what you've been doing? Um, if you can take some of the risk out of it, um, it can actually, I think, help adoption. Yeah, exactly. So if somebody wants more information, how can they get a hold of you or your book? Well, the... Um, um, in terms of getting a hold of Anne or I, um, we can be contacted through one of two ways, either through our website, which is uh, www.dig2grow.com. That's dig, the number two, grow.com. And that will tell you more about our books. It's basically our website as writers uh, that will tell you about what the books are. Um, and we're also active on Twitter with our handle is at dig2grow, dig, the number two, grow. 
And you know, our books should be available anywhere that books are sold. Or they could be ordered through there. Um, you know, one can order them through the usual online places or, or your local bookstore. But there's really a trilogy of books. We like to call it our Dirt Trilogy. The first mm-hmm. one is Dirt, the Erosion of Civilizations, and that tells the history of land destruction in past societies. The second one, Anne and I wrote together. It's called The Hidden Half of Nature, and I think you're talking with her about it next week. And mm-hmm. that tells the story of how she restored our garden, re- rebuilt the, so- the fertility of our soil, and explores the parallels between the human gut and the root system of plants in terms of their microbiomes. And then Growing a Revolution, the one we were mostly talking about today, is the most recent one, just literally came out in paperback, I think, last week. So those people who are waiting for the paperback, it's, it's come. <laughs> um, and but, that one talks about all this regenerative farming around the world. Well, that's perfect. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, Rebecca, it's my pleasure. I enjoyed talking to you. And um, I want to thank everybody for listening. If you want more about my story, you can uh, read or listen to it on uh, my website, dr-risk.com. Thanks so much for listening. Be sure to make today a great day. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Please join Dr. Rebecca Risk again next Monday at noon Eastern Time and 9 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness.